Hi, welcome to the Signal Pad. I have a special episode for you guys because I have with me the brand new MSO 58 from Tektronix, which was announced just today. And I have it for a couple of days, even though I can't do a full review on it because this unit is in such high demand for everyone to see it. But I asked them to let me keep it long enough to give you at least an introductory video of what this thing can do. The people who brought it and showed it to me were so passionate about all the innovations and all the effort that tech has to go into creating this brand new instrument essentially from zero because everything in it is new. So I want to show you what it can do, take a look at it, and also discuss some of its unique capabilities. It's difficult to innovate in the oscilloscope space, especially in the mid-range because there's just so many models on the market. But what they've done is pretty special. So let me show you. Well, are you ready? Let's take a look. And here we are, and check it out, it is eight channels. It's an eight channel oscilloscope and therefore the name MSO58. This is a 6.25 giga sample per second, two gigahertz of bandwidth, eight channel mixed signal oscilloscope. But it's much more special than that. So what Tech has done is that they have designed their own A2D converters from scratch in a CMOS process. But they have combined the data acquisition and the data collection from each A2D, which involves processing it, correcting for errors in the A2D, and all the traditional acquisition circuitry you find in, on a traditional oscilloscope, and they've put it in a single chip, which means that that chip is now much more efficient, and therefore they can have eight of them. And this also means that no matter how many of these eight channels are on, you will always get 6.25 giga sample per second and two gigahertz of bandwidth. It has nothing to do with how many channels are turned on because each channel has a dedicated chipset that Tech has made just for the purposes of that one channel. This makes it really powerful. And to make it even more powerful, those A to D converters are actually 12 bits in hardware, meaning that when you have all of these eight channels turned on, the scope is processing 600 gigabit per second worth of data internally in the eight chipsets that are in it. It's just a massive amount of computation. And thanks to the architecture they have designed, it makes it possible in this box. And I'll show you how deep it is. It's actually quite a nice size. But it's even more special than that because these oscilloscope channels are not traditional uh, analog channels. These are called flex channels and flex being flexible because they are both digital and analog combination. Now, if you look carefully, you can see inside here individual pads which would mate with the probe that you connect this to. Depending on what probe you connect to it, it will either be an analog channel or an eight digital channel. So if I were to connect eight digital probes to this, I will end up with 64 digital channels. I can turn this into a 64 channel logic analyzer if I wanted to. But as soon as I unplug one of those channel, one of those probes and plug in a regular probe, I will get a two gigahertz, 6.25 giga sample per second, analog channel at 12 bits. And the memory for each channel, whether it's analog or digital, it doesn't matter. It can be all the way up to 125 million points. So everything is completely independent. You never have to worry about compromising your measurement or compromising the quality, the bandwidth, the sample rate of your measurement by plugging and unplugging various channels. These are completely flexible channels. And the digital channels are have another unique feature that I really like. Their threshold is internally adjustable plus or minus 40 volts. So you're really not limited to CMOS input or TTL input. You can have inputs that are sitting at 30 volt offset and have it offset somewhere between 30 to 40. It doesn't matter. It will, you can adjust them with software internally to be able to threshold anywhere between that huge range of voltage, 80 volts. So that means that you can use this for any application. You don't have to worry about damaging or, or destroying the channels because if you're within that voltage range, you can use it and connect to it. And those signals can be anything. Could be from an uh, industrial application that's just simply not TTL, and it can handle that. This is huge for automotive applications as well as industrial applications. So as we can see, they have basically built it from scratch. It has a multi-touch capacitive display, which is uh, 15 inches, 15.6 inches, and it's HD 1920 by 1080. Finally, an HD display and an oscilloscope, which as you can imagine, when you have so many channels, analog and digital, the fidelity of the screen is extremely important because you want to be able to see what it is that you're looking for and be able to put a lot of information on it. Really nice look and feel to it. It's built like a tank. Uh, the handle, the bag, I'll show you some of that. It's a beautiful unit. Now, it is dual boot, meaning that it can either boot into Windows 
or you can boot into an internal operating system, which is an embedded si uh, operating system based on Unix. And you can have a hard drive. The hard drive plugs underneath here. There's a, a location for it where you can put the hard drive in, and that will have the Windows operating system. If you pull that hard drive out, it will boot into its own operating system. So you're never worried that it's going to become obsolete because, say, Windows stops supporting it. And if tech comes with a new Windows version for this, you just take the hard drive out, put the new hard drive in, and voila, you got your brand new Windows version uh, with the operating system that allows you to have, the, of course, the scope running and then use everything that Windows offers you. With the embedded version as well as the Windows version, they're committed to keep those versions up to date at the same time, so you always get the latest firmware upgrades and so on. And uh, uh, on the right side, of course, we have all the controls. We take a quick look at that because it has eight channels. You it's unreasonable to have eight knobs, so they have color-coded LEDs that show which channel is active. The GUI is completely new from scratch. Uh, it's not unlike anything else. This it was designed from the ground up with touch in mind, and it works quite well. I, I, I've saw, I have been playing with it, and I've seen them. The obviously the engineers play with it, so very interesting to take a look and see what they've done. It is fast, very, very fast. So I want to show you that as well. USB three. Uh, in the front, it has two USB 2.0 ports, USB 3 port, and everything else. We'll take a look in just a second. Now, at the back, it has the arbitrary waveform generator. Output is a 50 megahertz uh, arbitrary function generator, which is built into it. And the trigger on this has a frequency counter, but it's an eight-digit frequency counter. So it's actually quite precise, and an eight-digit frequency counter is very useful. So that is something that's built into it as well as well as, of course, reference in and reference out and trigger uh, out in the back and so on. It doesn't have a trigger input because you have so many channels that they figured that if you needed, you could use one of those channels for trigger input or one of the digital channels for trigger input. Uh, so it doesn't have one at the back. Uh, but I don't know, it has a VGA and DVI and so on, uh, so you can connect it to external monitors. But it's quite amazing because this has been in the works for a couple of years. It's not something that they just came up with. And uh, they were really passionate about it. And I want to show you some of the uh, innovations that's gone into it. Well, of course, you want to see it turned on. So let's turn it on. Now, let me show you one other little thing just to give you an idea of the extent in which they've been paying attention to the details. Now, normally, when you have the scope like this on your desk and you want to reach the back, people tend to grab the handle and lean it forward uh, in order to reach the back. And I'm sure as soon as I did that, you were worried that the legs are going to collapse and it's going to fall onto it, either onto the device or even off the table. But what they've done is that they've designed these such that when it's lifted up, you can see there is a bit of a movement here. This movement, when it's pressed in, locks the leg, so the leg can be pulled back. But when it's pulled out, the leg will go back. I mean, it's just such a simple but brilliant solution to a problem that's been plaguing oscilloscopes for quite some time. And uh, of course, when it's sitting like that, the legs will be pushed in, and it will never collapse. So this is, this is what I was talking about, is the amount of attention they paid to feedback from the customers to observations from engineers. It's designed for engineers, by engineers. It's one of the things that they keep saying. And I, I want to show you some of the GUI features, because it's, it's pretty cool. And here it is, booted up and ready. It's booted into its own internal operating system, so there's no Windows running on this machine right now. And here's the brand new GUI. Now, the screen is non-reflective. It has a matte finish, which is great. And uh, even though you see a bit of the reflection of the camera, it's very difficult to avoid that with the camera because it's straight looking at it. Uh, other than that, the screen is beautiful. It's crisp, and it's uh, high resolution. The only complaint I have about the screen is that it could be a little bit brighter. Uh, my lab is really bright, and some of the labs out there obviously are quite bright. So a little extra brightness would definitely help. And uh, so when they say that the GUI is designed from scratch, you, what you would expect is a certain level of consistency. And consistency is everything in user experience. Because if I say that double tap will do something, it should do the same thing no matter what, no matter where I am in the GUI. Or if a single tap has a functionality, it should be the same everywhere. And they've done a pretty good job at keeping that consistent. Now, the black border around the screen is also very helpful because the screen is flush with the surface of the instrument. This means that they can use the black area for additional gestures and help you uh, do something that starts from outside of the screen. That can be really handy. For example, if I want to bring the menus at the top, I can swipe down and I will get the menu, which makes it quite nice. I don't have to try and hit that, for example, button perfectly. Now, from your angle, I'm sure you think that the font is a little too small. And uh, it could be a little bit larger, but again, that's an easy thing to change. Uh, the screen is very high resolution, so they can afford to make it a little bit larger if they want to. And uh, the, you're looking at it, obviously, from the entire dimension. So it's, you're looking at it from a little bit further away. But I also think that the font being a bit bigger would be helpful. Now, 
the, there's a consistency in the GUI, and that's a double tap will bring up menus, and a single tap will bring the most used functionality of a menu. For example, double tap here will give me the menu for this general viewing area of the waveforms. Now, single tap will get rid of it. Now here is the channel one settings. Right now, 100 millivolt per division, one mega ohm, 500 megahertz bandwidth. Now, if I double tap that, I get the menu for channel one. If I tap outside, it will go away. If I do a single tap on it, I get the most used uh, functionality of that particular setting. So obviously for channel one, what is the most, you, what is the most common thing you're gonna use? Well, you're gonna change the vertical spacing and that's exactly what those two that little buttons are. So I can make it more, I can make it less. So exactly as you would expect. You tap once again, and it goes away. Now, same thing with horizontal double tap. I get all the horizontal menu, do a single tap. I get the spacing, I can adjust that. Obviously, these knobs all work, but this is convenient. Uh, so I actually find myself not touching the knobs as much, which I'm really surprised. The first time I think that I have, uh, I don't really touch these as often. Uh, and uh, with the trigger, same thing. You double tap the trigger, you get a trigger menu. Nice, everything is nicely drawn. Everything is brand new, clean, and it's fast. And you'll see some of the speed and tap, and it will go away. So let's go ahead and plug a probe into it and see what happens. So here's a traditional, you know, Tech VPI probe. There it is. And you've seen this, you know, the MDOs and so on that I've reviewed. They all use this. And this is a regular one gigahertz uh, passive probe. Let's go ahead and plug it in. We plug it in, and there it is. It reconfigures it. It knows it's a one gigahertz probe, so it changed it. One gigahertz, now it's 200 millivolt per division there. And the waveform that you see is from my wireless microphone, which is around 600 megahertz or so. And yeah, so if I bring it closer to my wireless microphone transmitter, ooh, that's an enormous signal. And uh, it's kind of floating, so you would expect to catch it like an antenna. And if I can go ahead and disconnect it, and then it will also do the same thing. There you go. It will get rid of it and go back to its uh, normal settings. Now, I can go ahead and plug this. Here is the brand new uh, probe designed for these channels, which can take advantage of the eight digital channels, which all of these are capable of. So if I go ahead and take the same, th I mean, pr plug it into the exact same port. This, this, the one I was using just now, plug it into here and lock it into place. There is eight digital channels. I mean, I don't have to do anything. Now this is an eight digital channel uh, system. Now the same label that used to be my analog channel now turned into a digital channel. So I double tap and I get all my digital threshold settings and so on. So it, it reconfigures the GUI in order depending on what's plugged in and it does it instantly. And I can go ahead, for example, and unplug it back to the analog channel, but look how fast it switches. Remember what is actually happening internally, right? It, it's not just showing you something different, it's doing a different measurement altogether. But because it's all in one IC, it's just fast and it just jumps between them really quickly. It, it's really quite impressive. And if I want to do various measurements, I can do them as well. Now, uh, there's a couple of quick access menus down here. Uh, so if I tap on two, it will turn on channel two. And as you can see, channel two has been enabled and the color of those knobs has changed because now these two are tied to channel two. And instead of overlaying them, they stack them uh, because they notice that one of the very first thing engineers do uh, when they enable a new channel is they go ahead and adjust them and separate them uh, in order to be able to see them individually. But when you do that, you eat into your data converter's dynamic range because you are artificially adding an offset to a channel. You don't want to do that. So they start with this uh, so that you can see them cleanly. And because this is an HD display, this is easy to do. And uh, you can still have the fidelity of the waveform and look at the waveform uh, very easily. But you can, of course, always double tap and say instead of stacked, Give me an overlay view, and you'll get an overlay view. You've got to go stacked, go back to the way it was. And same thing, if I do enable channel three, I get three channels. You can see the color again changing. Now I have my third channel at the bottom, and all my settings of all my three channels over here. And it's also pretty straightforward. So let's zoom in a little bit to get a closer look. So I was talking about the fact that uh, the instrument also gives you the number of bits that you're getting, depending on the setting of the unit. So if I go ahead and enable high resolution mode, which you can do either with a button in the front panel or double tapping here and going to high resolution mode, now I, you can see I have 12 bits. And if I change my horizontal spacing, you can see, well, eventually I will go beyond 12 bits. So now I am 13 bits, 14 bits, 15 bits, and then eventually 16 bits. Of course, the bandwidth is going to be limited right now. We are at 50 megahertz bandwidth, you can see down here. But remember, it doesn't matter how many channels are on. It's exactly the same. I can go and turn channel four on. It makes no difference to what is going on here. 
And uh, that 16 bits is, of course, because you're oversampling, and then you can correct for that in DSP once you have the extra samples. So it's a, a common technique that is used uh, in other instruments as well. So that's how you, you can get uh, more bits from that. So I'm hoping to give you an idea of some of the capabilities just before we do any measurements. So uh, as I mentioned, there is an ar arbitrary function generator. So if you tap on that, you get the arbitrary function generator settings, which are coming from the back of the unit. Let's get rid of that. There's also a digital volt uh, voltmeter, and there it is. You can see it's measuring the DVM on that particular channel. It's doing it on channel one right there, DC, you know, one millivolt or so. Now, if I want to get rid of that, I can just drag it and drop it into the trash can. There's a <laughs> trash can in the corner, and I'm hoping that they will do it maybe a little bit easier way to get rid of something, something like flicking it or pushing it out of the way. But uh, those are very easy to do. Now that they have the groundwork, the framework of doing that. Now, if I want to do a measurement, let's say I want to do a cursor or anything else, obviously it's much nicer to do that on an actual signal. So there's a demo board. It's an easy way to create some signals. Let's look it up and see what it does. So this scope can do half a million waveforms per second. So we should be able to catch very rare anomalies quite easily. And here's an example of that. So this signal has an anomaly in it, and it's not the fact that it's jumping around. The anomaly is much more hidden than that. So we want to find it. Well, one of the very first things we can do is we can turn on fast acquisition. And there's a button in the front panel that does that. Or we can go through the horizontal menu and turn on fast acquisition. And that gives you a color grading functionality. Now, if you look carefully, you can see actually our little tiny problem that occasionally appears. Now its frequency is, is very rare, so it doesn't show up as bright colors. But we can tap over here and turn on infinite precision, uh, which is over here. We can turn on infinite, and now uh, as soon as we catch it, we will always see it. Now, because it's a rare event and you can uh, only see it occasionally, you want to be able to trigger on it. Well, that's also pretty pretty straightforward. So let me go ahead and turn fast acquisition off, and let me go ahead and turn off infinite to off so we can get this signal back but I can go under my trigger menu and I can say instead of an edge give me a runt trigger so this runt trigger will now trigger only on the event of this uh, particular runt event and we can we can set that up so your upper limit of that uh, we can turn to let's say two volts I cannot by the way I can move it and put it here if I want to so let's go to two volts and uh, the bottom one we can set to let's say one volt over here. So now it will only capture when the runt event with those conditions happens. So let's go get rid of that. And I can go ahead and put it onto normal trigger uh, mode. And there's normal. And there it is. I can catch this event every time it happens. And you m if you look carefully, you can see that it's updating occasionally. And many, many thousands and millions of waveforms come and go uh, before these particular ones are caught and displayed. Now, if I also want to measure with the cursor, uh, let's say, just as an example, let's say channel 2 is also enabled over there. So, again, it has nothing to do with how many channels I'm, in, I'm enabling. The fact that this is running slowly at the bottom is because we're only catching occasional anomalies. It has nothing to do with the speed of the scope. If I remove, if I go back to auto trigger, we're back to the regular speed. So, let's go back to normal here. So, there it is. We're catching that. Now, if I go ahead on the cursor here, and I grab the cursor. If I drop it here, you can see how the color of the cursor it matches the channel. If I bring it down here, it's going to do it on that channel. So let's leave it up here. And there's my cursor. And it's going to measure it on that channel. And the, dis the, the numbers are shown. You can grab the numbers, bring it down here. If you don't want it to be in your way, we can grab that and put it right there. We can bring this one over and put it right here. And it works. It's just smooth. I really like it. So uh, this is on a 1 volt per division right now, right over here. So if I go ahead and, and move the waveform, you can see that it jumps in this one volt per division step. So it's kind of jumps in these quantized steps. And same thing if I go this way. You can see it doesn't give me these. Sometimes it, when you do it in some other instruments, these numbers become all really weird. Uh, so you don't want that, especially the vertical ones. So you want these nice round numbers. So it, it keeps that uh, in mind. And it's easy to grab these again. You can see it's not going to accidentally. So if I want to move the waveform, I can move the waveform. If I move the cursor, I move the cursor. You see how nice and quick and responsive this is? I mean, it just it just does exactly what I want. It doesn't make mistakes. It's great. It really is. And they have thought about a lot about this and making sure that it, it does what you're looking for. Again, the font could be a little larger, but other than that, it's beautiful. So it's just an example of, of catching a rare event with the instrument. You can see how easy it is to set up. Another quick thing I wanted to show you, as you know, there is a zoom functionality built into the Tektronix scopes, and uh, you want to be able to go through a lot of data and so on. I'll show you that in a second. But the zoom functionality is very easy to engage. Then there's a button in the front that launches it, or you can just simply select here. And I, let's say I want to take a look at this corner over here. I just drag, 
And there it is, that's my corner. You can see some anomalies, some behavior over here. You can see the nicely the zoom version, a live display at the top, which is fast and responsive. And you don't want it, you go away, you push the button, and it goes back to where it was. So it is really quite helpful when you want to find something and, and you want it to be responsive. So it's kind of seamless when you're searching for an event. So let's do something a little different. So here's a nice squared C data coming onto the scope. So on channel one, we have the clock. On channel two, we have the data. So it's now obviously randomly triggering on some rising edge of one of these signals. You can see it's rising edge on channel one is being triggered there. So let's say I want to do some more advanced triggering. Well, we can easily do that. Let's trigger on an actual I squared C data. Now, before we do that, we should define a bus. And here at the bottom, we have one of these quick access functions, which is add a bus. So I can tap that. Now I get an option of doing that. So with a bus type in this particular case is I squared C. And the I squared C is between channel one and channel two. That's exactly what we want. And we can change the thresholds. So let's change the thresholds, I don't know, somewhere, let's say in the vicinity of, I can maybe one and a half to two, so it'll probably be okay. So let's say 1.4 you know, is enough. And on this one, we can go ahead and change that also to 1.5 or so, and there it is. So now we have our bus defined. And if you look carefully, we can see that indeed we're getting some activity on our bus, so it's reading that data. So let's go zoom out a little bit more. Let's sit around, let's say, here's a 100 microsecond per division. So it is triggering the whole, the, the entire width of the memory and is decoding it for us. So great. So now I want to trigger on this in order for uh, be able to catch a particular event. So I can go ahead and do that. So let's double tap here. And let's go, instead of an edge trigger, let's define a bus trigger. And this bus trigger is going to be defined on our I squared C. And instead of the star, let's go and say, I'm looking for a particular address. And I can go ahead and enter that address. So let's enter that address to be 50 is a, is a possibility. So let's say here's 5. And here is 0. There it is. So now if you look carefully, it will trigger each time address 50 is uh, showing up. So this will now allow you to capture a particular I squared C event. And let's say I want to see the table of all of the activities. Now instead of 100 microsecond per division, let's go a little bit larger to one millisecond per division. There's tons and tons of data coming through. And I can go ahead now over here and type, tap on plot. Oops, sorry, not plot. I want table. Where is table? Here's results table. And I want a bus results table. And I'm going to go and add that. And you can get rid of the result there. There we go. Check it out, we got all of our activity over here, exactly what you would expect to see, continuously being decoded, you can scroll through it, you can find everything you're looking for, you know, you can easily go up and down and see all the, everything that's within the bandwidth of a single trigger there. So let me go ahead and turn the zoom off here. So as, as soon as you touch this, obviously, you're going to get a zoom event, because uh, you can select any of these events and then see it in the waveform. So let's say I'm looking for a very specific sequence of things that's happening. So let's say I'm looking for a data that's coming on through the channel, and I want to catch that specific data. So now we can do a search, and this is really handy. So let's go ahead and click on search there. And on search, um, I can tell it, obviously, a whole bunch of different things you can search for. And one of them is, again, on the bus. So we can select the bus. And let's say we're looking for a data that's 1x, so data that's starting with a value of 1. And I can go ahead and tap on that. And I can change that to, let's say, a value of 1. Now, if I tap over here, you can see that it is finding nine events in that sequence that meets that criteria. So let's do a single trigger here so we can capture the single data. So there is all of our data. And if I tap on this once, you can see that I get these arrows, which means I can jump between exactly the events that are in the queue that's been caught. So let me get rid of this table so you can get a better idea. So here's my waveform. Here's my channel one, here's my channel two, here's my bus, here's the zoomed window. And I can go through my results and it will go to exactly the location where that, that, where that data is. So here's data 1.8, here's data 1.6, here's data 1.4. But just think about what I just did. I mean, I, I set up a lot of things in a very quick amount of time and it's very responsive, as you can see from the GUI directly, never having to touch really any of the buttons. And uh, yeah, it's great. Now, if I would continue like this, I'm never going to stop. And I have to give this back, and I'm traveling tomorrow. But I, I would love to spend some more time with this instrument. So in fact, I'm going to get one later for a full review to show you exactly what's going on. And, and hopefully, maybe even do a teardown of it. I'll have to see if that's possible. But there's tons of experiments that I, that I want to show you that I want to measure its analog performance. I want to turn on all of his digital channels and do some massive parallel digital capturing. Uh, there's a, I want to see what kind of radio signals we can cache with it because it, it does have a 2 gigahertz bandwidth. So I'm really eager to play around with it and, and find out what it can do. 
But uh, of course, I, I can't do all of that right now, but I wanted to give you at least a little teaser of what's going on and, and the new GUI and the feel and, and the effort that's going into design this instrument and hopefully to keep you excited until I can get one to do proper testing on. So, uh, you know, just wait for it, be a little patient and go check the website, look at all of its specifications in detail, look at some of the other material they're going to be releasing when this video also comes out and see what uh, some of its capabilities are. You can also type some questions and I'm sure they will be happy to answer you uh, on my channel as well. And I'm really excited about this, so I'll see you soon.